Hello everyone, um, this is my second attempt uh, to create a video on the AQA English Language Paper 1, Question 5, the Creative or Descriptive Writing section. I'll be using those terms interchangeably because they are very similar um, and I won't trouble the difference between them. So, I'll be kind of talking about the examiner report, which I'm sure you've had so much time to look at in your abundant free time. Um, but I'll be kind of ad adapting it. That was a joke, by the way. I'll be adapting it and making it more relatable, offering some ways to um, unlock techniques, some tips, some tricks, um, if you will, some just some ways to think about what we have in front of us, some how-tos and some don't-tos. And hopefully, maybe, um, trying to kind of plan it myself uh, in real time to see how I am not perfect and I'm not uh, I'm far from perfect and tutors and teachers uh, I'm a tutor by the way are, are far from perfect so when you see those pre-prepared YouTube videos and you're dazzled by by their kind of um, their, their, their quickness um, this is this everything has a is has a technique to it so let, let's walk you through that I guess so we have uh, 45 minutes, basically, uh, five, 10 minutes to plan that, hopefully five, depending on how, how much we're inspired by what we have in front of us. So they have a magazine has asked for contributions for their creative writing section. Okay, so either write a description of an old person as suggested by this picture of an older man, or write a story about the time when things turned out unexpectedly. Okay, right, um, what we do have uh, in fact, is um, I've adapted some of the uh, examiner reports. So they say it's obviously a gender neutral term. Um, we can focus on women, you know, an old person, not the old man himself. Um, we don't have to describe the very elderly. This man might have some years in him left, in other words. And, you know, what would get us a low mark to begin with is just by looking at him describing his very disheveled, silvery appearance, um, his thick set kind of um, bags and wrinkles, um, the kind of dirt and lines, veins and muscles in his face. Um, what would get us a higher mark, and as what we'll discuss now, is kind of what we infer, what we take from, from the gaps, if you will, what we extrapolate and unpack from from the details of this image. So you may notice, for example, actually, and this wasn't exactly uh, mentioned in the examiner report, um, this looks like a, a very washed out, desaturated, I think the term is, um, photo from the days of old. And and what, what also lends me to think that is because um, in recolorized photos, um, so formerly black and white photos, they are colored by hand and the colors are not really accurate. They look a bit old, kind of odd and not quite accurate so this kind of reminds me of that where it looks recolorized by by someone um, either digitally or by hand so it looks like someone you know it could be a photo that someone discovers um, of their grandparents or an arctic explorer that goes wrong so this could that could be related to a time when things turn out unexpectedly or if we look at you know the examiner report that i've adapted um some just focus on the eyes and the secrets or wisdom or loss on display. So does that look like loss or wisdom? Does that look like, what does that look like to you? So if, you can often tell, perhaps they say, um, what's, what's, uh, what's going on in a person, inside a person, if we just cover up their, their smile and the bottom half of their face and just look exclusively at their eyes. So does that look like a weary person? Um, we can't really see his smile, to be fair. So, anyway, um, others, you know, think about, you know, his, um, not only his physical appearance, but maybe, you know, extrapolating from that, his personality and circle, social kind of circumstances, that so he might be homeless or a war veteran, he might be a dying king or a battle scar warrior, he may be your grandparent, he may be someone else's grandparents, he may be an elderly neighbour, we have so much license with this. It's a great question. Um, you have so much artistic license, but all they advise against is straightforward description of the picture, um, mostly consisting of he was wrinkly, he has deep set bags, and it's really something to blow in kind of inspiration. Um, inspiration comes from the word inspire, 
I think if I'm saying that right, which means to breathe fire into something. So if this photo breathes fire into into your imagination, it kind of lights up, feeds your flame, um, let it do so and just go with that. When you're planning, I would say commit quickly. Um, this is the practical bit of advice. Commit quickly to your what you're going to write about and um, try and think about it in terms of when you're planning a beginning, a middle, something dramatic that will captivate your uh, the examiner's attention and something that resolves nicely. It doesn't necessarily have to. Um, you may think about it as a kind of, um, you may choose, for example, to think, um, to write just about your granddad and your, your granddad's favourite um, favorite thing in the world to your granddad at the allotment, write a description of your old, uh, an old person suggested by this picture. And that can be, as I say, um, your own personal, lyrical, moving and poignant response. Um, and kind of, I guess, somewhat ironically um, or they just in a way that's a challenge for you as teenagers um, you have to reflect on the ravages of old age which is something that will come to you but not right now of course um, so it really uh, asks you to think about things that you aren't really um, quite ready for it's to tackle quite mature and conceptual ideas surrounding death and the human condition so you have all that to look forward to I'm sure um, so we'll look at that in, in a bit more detail in a second, but the second, the second option is a, a narrative perhaps about when things turned out um, unexpectedly uh, and it might be less popular. Of course, aging isn't quite the same as, um, as you know, the unexpected. The unexpected can be anything from um, war, a coup, natural disaster, an earthquake, etc, etc, tsunamis. Um, and so th this is really captured in the examiner's report when um, they've said, uh, you know, alien ab abduction stories, uh, discovering previously unknown family members, blind dates, uh, and a murderer who kept victims' heads in the freezer, supposed medical cures that wiped out mankind. Um, but most people kept it kind of prosaic, more everyday, un unforeseen exam results, or scoring winning goals. So... I would go actually and say, um, while these are great, and obviously you're very proud of things, you know, your exam results, why shouldn't you be? You've worked very hard. Um, and you're obviously very proud of, you know, sports, the things that you do in sporting achievement. Try to try to think a little bit more, um, you know, try to go a bit uh, to, to the left field, as they say. Try to kind of think about things that may not get as much attention. Um, but don't be... If you can't really think of anything, safe is sometimes better than sorry. So don't go for something that you don't know, you know that you won't be able to write about. Um, so you, you may kind of um, begin with the unexpected event and then narrate the aftermath. If it's some kind of pandemic, um, obviously we're, you know, kind of dystopian zombie kind of movies and um, fiction is, has, is quite, has been quite popular in the last 20 years. So you may have seen things like The Walking Dead and Iron Legend and 28 Days Later and, and so on and so on. Um, so try and think a little bit outside of the box. I guess that that is a, is a cliche, but just try and think about something other than what you've seen and read. Um, and, and take what you've seen and read, um, you know, the way that kind of um, dialogue may tell you, characters may tell you, describe things about the past. Um, and um, tr try and kind of, um, yes, just try and basically take very, uh, your kind of description. So you may have a lot of description, you know, a bit of dialogue, a bit of, you know, sentence variation. So long sentences followed by short suspenseful ones. Um, but really have a lot of variation in there and have a lot of generic ver variation. So a lot of kind of running and chasing um, is is fine, but it's not going to. It's not necessarily going to get you higher marks. So um, you might think about having the unexpected event and then ending on a cliffhanger. I like this approach because um, it forces your reader actually to um, kind of sign on the dotted line after the action, your action has ended, and uh, it kind of uh, resonates and lingers in their imagination. Perhaps if you do it well enough. So cliffhangers are great, and as I say, both approaches are valid and work very well. So 
we want to have delicately handled imagery and I'll explain a little bit more about what that is. Um, so not overdoing the imagery, um, well-chosen adjectives and adverbs and structures that are impressive. So, you know, flashbacks or flash forwards, so analepsis or prolepsis as it's called. Um, you may choose to have a circular structure where um, um, someone comes back to the beginning of where they were um, either through you know saying a certain thing and then ending on the same sentence um, but we definitely need to plan overall. Students often think that they have to write about this photo in particular and as we said that's not the case we can write about any old person we can write about my grandparent your grandparent an arctic explorer a battle scarred warrior etc etc so Let's look at how the, the marking, the, the awards for the marks breaks down. So we have 24 marks for content and organization. So that's um, the, the, the kind of foremost AOs, one, two, three, and I think four as well. So we have the techniques and we have the structure. So the kind of form and the structure of that. And then technical accuracy is about using punctuation and grammar correctly and um, with AO6 now, we're rewarded for varying our sentence forms. Um, we're rewarded for varying our sentences, I should say. And so if we use longer sentences um, full of kind of things like comma splices and um, dialogue and apostrophes and even dashes, we have to that we have to get familiar with all of these to add meaning, um, to use them sparingly and correctly, then we might actually get more marks that way. So think about that. Um, English uh, language has changed actually quite um, noticeably since I, I was taking it back in, well, back when I was taking it. And um, so this didn't, AO6 didn't exist. So I would say, um, in fact, um, please do use longer sentences um, when, you, when you are being descriptive. Um, get familiar and I'm not going to do a video about this now because I think yeah, that's a video all by itself but um, get familiar with how you use semicolons so we use them when we have two independent clauses um, that's not necessarily the same thing as two independent sentences um, figure out how to use uh, M dashes and N dashes so one is different from the other um, so the the M dash is the longer one the, the, the length of two um, arches on an M and then N dash is um, slightly different. Think about how we use those. Um, we use it to break up, um, to have kind of things hanging in the middle of two, two clauses on either side and it, it makes kind of what's there st stand out. So, um, for example, I'm doing this correctly. Um, so that's how we might use an M dash, and I froze um, really captures the sense I think of kind of being frozen. Um, this, this this phrase is suspended there, and it, it 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 does add something I think to to how we read and how we how we draw breath and, and pause over these words. So that's that's one way, uh, for example, of how we might use dashes. So you might not have thought about dashes, or you might not have that may they may not have got so much attention in class. Um, so also think about the, the how you're using your um, adjectives and your metaphors and your similes. Um, so you might ask yourself, is this metaphor kind of unclear? Does it kind of obscure meaning? Is it a bit strange and weird? Do I think it's good because I think it's strange and weird? Um, but does it really get across the meaning I want to convey? So if you say, for example, you may have read in Laws of the Flies, um, I think this is a metaphor that William Golding uses, seen from above, the island looked like a baked bean. So it's a very strange metaphor. I think that's, that's something he uses. I may have read that somewhere else. Is it, is it, does it really add anything or does it just make you think that you're a good writer? Um, I don't want to throw too much doubt and uncertainty um, into the process, but I just think, I just want you to be clear about what you think uh, your metaphors and your, your descriptions are adding. Similarly, with that as well, um, as Mr. Braff has pointed out on, on the wonderful world of YouTube, um, you know, emotive and descriptive language is what you're being marked up for. Um, and the best way to get better at it is to look and read more fiction. So just to read 
uh, especially adult fiction. Um, I can't tell you which authors to read, but I can certainly, maybe in the comments, if you'd like to ask me uh, what you're interested in, I can kind of recommend things on the back of that. Um, but don't try and pack too many adjectives and adverbs into each sentence, especially not one sentence after another. Um, after some description about what, whatever's going on, um, say your granddad's allotment or something, uh, and, and, you know, the, the skylarks came, you know, the birds came dancing over across, across the, the autumn sky, and he, he looked up and gazed um, with admiration and fondness, etc., etc. And then after that, you might have some dialogue, or he may be having some dialogue with you, or whoever. So just think about different forms of narration and variation. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a whole kind of um, exercise in, in variation, really. So having some great descriptive language, so for example, the warm sea leapt, uh, lapped gently against the hot sand. And you might think this is a bit dull, you know, very banal, ordinary, safe, warm and hot, you know. That's, that's generally okay, actually, I would say. Um, you don't necessarily need to have um, a GCAC stunningly, um, you know, stunningly daring kind of um, adjective. So, for example, um, this is a sentence I've seen, or I've, you know, from Mr. Braff, the boiling sea smashed against the molten sand. You know, this might work if you're writing about an apocalyptic scenario, um, but otherwise, for a warm day, uh, it's too much. Um, unless you're writing about climate change, so you might actually want to go for hyperbole and exaggeration uh, and a very kind of overblown register. But think about what you are doing and why you're doing it. So you may actually want to do this. You may actually want to do this. But in this case, when we're writing about the unexpected, and you may be writing about something related to climate change and the unexpected, in which case, well done you. Um, but just think about what you intend to convey by doing this. Okay? Uh, and so we've talked a little bit about varying sentences, you know, sim simple and complex. Um, and another way of thinking about this grammatically is kind of single clause um, and multi-clause. So, for example, um, all, sent all clauses um, will have a, a subject and an object uh, and a verb. Um, a sentence, all sentences will have a subject, verb, object and an ob object, sorry. Um, so, for example, some say we cannot afford to improve our planet. I would say we cannot afford not to spend this money. Okay, so this is kind of um, broken down uh, nicely by uh, the, the full stops. Um, the meaning is conveyed kind of quickly. The reader gets across it quickly. Um, with multi-clause, um, we might want to kind of have longer drawn out uh, winding sentences when we kind of want to sound more serious or complex or we want to kind of bring uh, two ideas more closely together. There are all, all sorts of reasons why we might want to have a multi-clause sentence. So here I've used kind of comma splicing. Um, so for example, the majority of cars, of the cars on London's roads are now hybrid engine vehicles. Although many of them, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, although many of them are st still have petrol combustion engines. Uh, that's, you know, you could take that out and the sentence will still work. So, for example, the majority of cars on London's roads are now hybrid engine vehicles, although there is much work still left to do when improving air quality. So this kind of uh, independent kind of dangling clause in the middle um, is a kind of qualifier, as they say. So that might be useful if you want to, if you want to kind of um, capture the shades of grey between two positions. So you might say, things are improving on London's roads, however, there is lots to do. And you might say, although... X percent of them still have petrol and c petrol combustion engines. So you may you might be if you're a student in London, you may know about the ultra low emission zone that's coming into effect slowly but surely in the in the years to come. So just think about that. Um, obviously, that it's slightly different when you're writing fiction, and you know a lot of fiction doesn't have this kind of more academic, um, tentative kind of language. It's not trying to balance things um, so much. It's just trying to. Uh, entertain and thrill or kind of um, in this case convey something about age and the human condition or in fact thrill and entertain if you're doing something about the unexpected okay right I think I'm going to leave it there maybe I will plan something for you here um, is there anything else that I might want to tell you well three to four sides is plenty 
don't write too much. Really, you do really have 45 minutes. Maybe I should plan something. Um, I'm not... How much time do I have? Not very much, I think. Um, right. So. Here we go. Here we go. Wow. Let me plan something quickly. So, I'm going to write about my old, my grandparent and my granddad who took us down to buy a Christmas tree every year. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, so this is a question that kind of resonates with me, I think. So, you might say, I'm going to just plan it for you, I'm not going to write it. You might say on page one, introduce, you want to definitely introduce your characters. Introduce the characters, characters, yourself, whoever it is. In this case, it's my granddad and me. Uh, and and the neighbourhoods in which he, they lived. Uh, South East London. And the time of year. And the, and the setup, basically. The conceit, the setup, the action. Um, page one. Page two is kind of buying, buying the Christmas tree. Uh, buying this Christmas tree, how far away it is from the house, um, and the kind of stories uh, we would share along the way. It was roughly about 30 minutes away. Um, carrying the Christmas tree as, a, as an eight-year-old, and um, as it, well, however old I was, so we did it a few times. And, and my grand, grandpa, who is uh, kind of a very heavy man, or who is um, who is a, a tall and heavy man, I could say. And you could talk about that image actually. So you can talk about, you can think in images, and you can unpack those images, I suppose. The incongruity, or the the strange. So you might say, for example, this might also leap, lead you to any so any ideas that you kind of leap into your head or any possible sentences that leap into your head if you do think this way. And I'm not sure that, that um, you may do. But to the outsider, we must have looked strange. We must have looked strange. Two dashes. An eight-year-old. So use that correctly, those hyphens. And... A seven foot, a seven foot giant carrying a seven foot tree. So this is kind of exaggerating slightly. Um, my grand, my grandma's not quite seven foot, but he is very tall. Uh, and the, uh, the trees that we got were not seven foot, seven foot, but they were also very tall. So, um, and I did help him carry it. So, think about those sorts of things, and then um, think about how it might resolve. Will it, will, how will it resolve? Um, Will it resolve with the dying of the tree? Um, will it resolve with um, a sentence that ends something like, I was sad, but I knew that Christmas would come again? Or will it end on a more poignant kind of... Um, will it end with... As illness is also very kind of... Um, you know, very prominent uh, in our lives, in, in your grandparents' lives, perhaps. Um, will it end with something very kind of unfortunate happening? So think about how it might end. Um, will it end with your parent coming home, coming to your grandparents? And asking how your day went. And you could sort of understate it with dialogue. And you could kind of say, as kids do, oh, nothing much. Um, so, and of course, um, there's a slight irony here because we know, hopefully, if you've made it interesting, that um, actually the, 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 the relationship you and your grandparent have is actually quite touching. Um, especially if you have a lot of little details about the, the things that you talk about or the things that your grandparent might talk to you about. So think about what's really touching and important to you I would say actually with this question and just try and do it justice with um, very accurate and um, sensitively chosen imagery um, about how your granddad looks, how your, how your grandma or whoever it is looks um, 
and is um, and, and just try and work work from that I'm going to do more on this but hopefully this has been um, helpful so any questions please leave them below I will answer them in in detail there anyway I will see you perhaps in the next video thank you very much